Jason Bukovic had little to say in court today except to enter a plea of not guilty. He found information about his victims on the state's sex offender registry. Police say he tracked his victims to their homes and attacked them. In one case, he beat a man so severely with a hammer that he fractured his skull. Wesley Demarest is one of several men Bukovic is accused of assaulting. I figured he was going to kill me. He said, I'm going to, I'm the avenging angel, I'm going to meet out justice. And as for Jason Bukovic, if he's convicted of all the charges, he could get more than 30 years in prison. Hi guys. Okay, so we're gonna try to do this cooking in crime thing again. I'm gonna do a voiceover. Let me know what you think. A recipe down below. Just relax and enjoy the show. Bye. Or hi. Hi guys, and welcome to the first video using my new microphone. I pretty much don't know what I'm doing. I hope the audio sounds good. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll try to see what I can do. But let's just get started with the case. So today I wanna to talk about Jason Vukovic, AKA the Avenging Angel. That is what he called himself. And this case is pretty controversial because some people see him as a hero, while others, including the law, see him as a criminal. So Jason, well, what he would do is he would go on the uh, Alaskan Sex Offender Registry and he would find addresses of people there who committed particular crimes and he would take their information, their name, their address, and he would put it in a notebook. And he had a list of people in that notebook. And Jason only picked people who did stuff to kids. That was the criteria. And his first victim was 68 year old Charles Albee. It was about 9.30 AM on June 25, 2016. And there was a knock on Charles's door. When he answered it, it was Jason, the self-proclaimed avenging angel. Charles remembered seeing Jason's notebook with the list of names and addresses when he opened the door. Jason forced his way in and told Charles to sit on his bed and then he started slapping Charles. He then told Charles that he was there because Charles was a sex offender. According to the listing on the registry, Charles Albee's crime was that he was convicted in 2003 of second degree abuse of a minor. So once Jason made that declaration, he started punching Charles repeatedly, and then he stole things from him and ran off. Two days after that, Jason was knocking on 25 year old Andre Barbosa's door. This time it was 4 AM and Jason had two women with him and a hammer. So Andre Barbosa opened the door and Jason asked him if his name was quote Barbosa. Andre said yes. And then Jason threatened him with a hammer and forced his way into the house with the two women. Just like he did with Charles, Jason made Andre sit down and told him he was there to punish him for hurting kids. Now, according to the registry, Andre Barbosa was convicted of a charge that was possession of child pornography, and this happened in 2014. He punched Barbosa in the face several times and threatened to, quote, bash in his dome with the hammer. So then Jason and one of the women stole stuff from the home and fled in Andre's truck while the other women recorded it on her cell phone, which is how police found, you know, this part of the crime out, as if almost like he was on a schedule. Two days after that, Jason was standing outside Wesley Demarest's house. Now, it was 1 a.m., and this time, Jason would take it farther than he ever had before. He started by smashing one of Wesley's windows in, and then Wesley's roommate woke him up and told him that someone had just smashed their window. But by that point, it was too late because Jason was already inside. He had creeped up behind Wesley's roommate as the roommate was telling Wesley that. And Jason was holding his signature hammer. He then told the roommate to leave. And when the roommate left, Jason told Wesley to get down on his knees or lie down on his bed. But Wesley refused to do either. And Jason hit him in the head with the hammer 
like four or five times. And this bludgeoning was so insanely violent that it resulted in a skull fracture as well as a traumatic brain injury. According to Wesley, quote, it's one o'clock in the morning. My roommate came pounding on my door and said, someone is trying to break in. And a guy was standing behind him and pushed him out of the way and he was carrying a hammer. Wesley said that Jason asked him if he was a registered offender and Wesley said yes. He then, this is the quote, he then said, he asked if I thought I paid for my crime and I said, yeah. He said, no, you didn't pay for it enough. He told me to lay down on my bed and I said, no. He said, get on your knees and I said, no. He said, I'm an avenging angel. I'm going to met out justice for the people you hurt. Now, according to the registry, in 2006, Wesley was convicted of attempted sexual abuse of a minor. According to the charges, the girl was in kindergarten at the time. <sighs> Damn. Wesley said, I didn't feel I deserved it, but I guess I do. I guess my punishment isn't over yet. Now, in terms of Wesley's punishment, he served nine months in jail and went to a sex offender treatment program for three years. So, Wesley was beaten as unconscious, and while Wesley was unconscious, Jason did what he usually does, which is he stole. He took a bunch of stuff, including a laptop computer, and he fled the scene. So, Wesley's roommate had called 911, and then when the cops got there, they searched the area and found Jason in a car with the hammer and the notebook, which included Wesley's name as well as the other guys he attacked, plus more names. They also found several stolen items from the previous crimes he had committed, and so Jason was arrested. They ended up giving him 18 charges for assault, robbery, burglary, and theft. And Jason pleaded not guilty. After Jason was arrested, he wrote a two-page letter to media from jail explaining his background and saying that his adoptive father abused him sexually and physically. Quote, he was a pretty terrible person in general. He liked to administer beatings with various implements, belts, eventually a two by four that he had custom made, and he used to like to disrupt the night by coming in to sexually assault me. I suffered through repeated molestation at his hands. Jason identified his adoptive father as Larry Lee Fulton. According to a 1989 article from the Anchorage Daily News, it said that Larry Lee was found guilty of second degree abuse of a minor. This is similar to one of the charges that the other guys, uh, Jason attacked had by the way, but that Larry Lee only received a three year suspended sentence from the judge and then the judge had ordered larry lee to stay away from jason but he didn't according to jason larry lee returned immediately to the home and isolated me out in wysia wysilla wasia oh my god it's like a town in, in alaska that i'm totally butchering i'm sorry i, I think it's wasia i'm so sorry i'm just an ignorant californian so in the letter jason continued quote what I can say at this time is that after being physically and mentally abused by a predator, my life was forever changed. I literally gave my own existence no value or concern. I became a thief and a liar and went on to make many poor choices throughout my life. Jason said he never got professional help. Instead, he turned to a life of crime. Quote, I'm far from perfect, a flawed and imperfect individual like everyone else. And then Jason went on to explain that that's why he targeted the men who had committed similar abuses that he had suffered as a child. And then at the end of his letter, he said that children should be able to play in the streets and parks and go to church without the threat of pedos lingering around them. My own heart may have been broken long ago, but with all my being, I support every child in pursuit of their dreams. However, it's important to me that someone else who was born and raised in Alaska who had a similar upbringing doesn't end up with this outcome because quite candidly, it sucks. So I want to talk a little bit about the lead up to the crimes that he committed. He actually got out of jail the day before he began his string of attacks and he had been in and out of jail pretty much his whole life. And according to his attorney, 
when he got out of jail, the day before he attacked those men, he started compiling this list of names from the registry in this notebook. At the time when he was found, he had nine names in the notebook. And everybody said he carried it around with him. And all three men that were attacked remember him holding the notebook and referencing it. So when you look at the timeline, it was within the first week of his release that he managed to, in just one week, gain entry to the homes of three men. He hit the first two men with his fists, but the third one he hit with the hammer and it was his most um, violent attack to date. And so, you know, the prosecution was basically saying that who knows what he would have done as he was becoming more violent and there were more names in the book. Who knows what could have happened if he wasn't caught when he was caught. So at first, Jason had pled not guilty, but then he took a plea deal. And he ended up pleading guilty to first degree attempted assault and a consolidated count of first degree robbery. And in exchange, the prosecutors dropped like more than a dozen charges. Remember, he had like 18 charges. So they dropped more than a dozen and they left him with just those charges I mentioned earlier. It was then time for the sentencing. And during the sentencing proceedings, his older brother came in to talk a little bit about their childhood. He was estranged from his brother, but they both endured the same thing growing up. And so his brother is called Joel Fulton, and this is what he said in court. Quote, we roll over on the bunk beds and be up against the wall. I can't look at you, man. I'm sorry, he said to Jason while he was trying to hold back his tears. It was my job to go first so he would leave Jason alone. I'm never going to get better. Never. Have mercy on him. Help him. And then Jason and Joel smiled at each other in court. You know, they hadn't seen each other in a very long time because Jason's brother, Joel, he actually ran away from home to escape the abuse and he was older. And so Jason was left behind with Larry Lee until he eventually ran away too. And it's very interesting because although they both suffered similar abuse, their lives took different paths because Joel, he went to college and he was able to complete a PhD and then he had this successful career in cybersecurity in California. He was making a lot of money, but despite all of that, he was going through tons of counseling and said that he hasn't recovered from the abuse. Whereas Jason, his life just completely spiraled because he, after running away, he got into drugs and then he was getting into jail. He started using meth and then he was like stealing and he had like this in and out of jail kind of lifestyle. And it was pretty depressing to see where he ended up and where he came from. But the prosecution didn't think that he deserved mercy actually, because see, Jason had proposed that his sentence be no longer than the combined prison terms that his three victims had to serve for their offenses plus the sentence that was given to Larry Lee who hurt him as a child. He said if you combine all their time I shouldn't do more than that. But the prosecutor did not agree. The prosecutor said quote we're lucky that we're not dealing with a murder charge. People do not get to take the law into their own hands just because they don't like a particular group of people or a particular person. And so now it was time for the judge to determine Jason's sentence. The judge had a lot to say, actually, and this is what he said. Vigilantism is not something that we accept in America. It's not something that we will accept in this community. And it is just simply something that will not be tolerated. It was not the purpose of the registry to allow people to do their own brand of justice. The purpose of the registry was to keep the community safe. So Jason apologized to the judge. He said, quote, I realize now that I had no business assaulting these individuals or taking the law into my own hands. I should have sought mental health counseling before I exploded. And, you know, although the judge did express sympathy for Jason's childhood trauma, he said that Jason has proved that he is dangerous and, quote, willing to hurt people, end quote. And so he sentenced Jason to 28 years in prison with five years suspended and then five years probation after his time is served. Now, Jason appealed this sentence. He said that 
you know, his post-traumatic stress disorder should have been considered as a mitigating factor for his crimes. He said that he was committing these crimes while, quote, under some degree of duress. And then they had a doctor come in and testify that his behaviors were, quote, consistent with someone who suffered from PTSD. Jason also claimed that the sentence should be appealed because it was excessive and it was not done with the intent of rehabilitating him. So I would love to know what you guys think about his sentence, if it was appropriate, if it was too much, not enough, just right. I would love to know your thoughts. But recently, Jason has been feeling lots of regret and he actually wanted to speak out and warn people against vigilante justice. He said, quote, if you have already lost your youth like me due to a child abuser, please do not throw away your present and your future by committing acts of violence. There is no place for vigilante justice in an ordered society. And so that's the story of Jason, the avenging angel. Do you see him as a hero? Do you see him as a criminal? Do you see him as something in the middle? Maybe just somebody who didn't know how to cope with the trauma in his life? I think it's really interesting how, you know, him and his brother had the same kind of experience in the beginning, but they went down different paths. And it just goes to show you a few things, I think. And this is just my opinion. First, it shows me that, you know, just because of what's happened in your life doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to end up a certain way. But I think it maybe increases the chances. And But it also shows me, too, that even with trauma, when you can, you know, move past it and actually be you know what society would consider successful like having a great job or being you know functioning in society that doesn't mean that you're okay you know and also that just because something bad happened to you doesn't mean your future is predetermined you still have a say in how your life turns out no matter when if things happen to you that you didn't have a say in do you know what i'm saying i don't know if i'm making any sense anyway so um that's pretty much it thank you guys so much for listening and watching i hope you like the recipe i hope you like this format as something new i'm trying and let me know if you like it uh what you liked about it what you didn't like about it just give me some feedback so anyway thank you guys so much and stay safe out there and, and i swear to god if you do something to some children i hope something really bad happens to you all right thanks guys bye <laughs>